Um, so this morning, I want to spend a little bit of time on the cross. Um, I have to say, by way of caveat, that I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be basically speaking from Eastern Orthodox theology. That's who I am. That's what I am. Uh, even long before I joined the Orthodox Church, uh, I, I had given up on a few of, of my evangelical or classic evangelical doctrines. One of those was penal substitution, and you'll have picked up on that last night, where I, I no longer believe that God is a punisher. Um, there is nothing in God's heart, nor is there a being higher than God called wrath or justice that he needs to satisfy through violent punishment. That's not how it works. And so I'll be a little vulnerable even though this is being recorded. Uh, the first time I ever said that publicly, I couldn't do it without a glass of wine. <laughs> because I knew what would happen, and it did. There is an aggression in parts of Christianity towards those who try to take away violent punishment from them by implying that God is love only. God's love, but he's also, no, God is love plus nothing. God has one nature, and while he has many attributes, every single attribute of God is a facet of that one diamond. The love of God is who he is in his very nature. And so even, even in his holiness, it's always and only holy love. In his justice, it's always and only just love. Even his wrath is the only, the, ra the goodness of God rejected by me. And as Paul Young teaches, uh, when we turn from the mercy and the love of God, we create a shadow. And what happens in that shadow? Well, that's on us, but we call it wrath. Okay, if you want to. The Bible does. But God is love. And so uh, that's one thing I want to say. Another is that many years ago, I, I, most of my teaching was on listening to God, and I would spend a lot of time developing exercises on hearing God. Um, you can get a book called Can You Hear Me that has 33 exercises and a whole theology on how to hear God without being a, a, like a wacko. So, um, when that was mostly all I was doing, I had a strange experience. I was praying one day, and an intrusive thought came through my mind, and the intrusive thought said this, and I won't make any claims for it at this point, but the intrusive thought said very clearly, stop telling people I was punishing my son. That's not what was happening. And I'm like, whoa, I had given my entire theological heart to penal substitution. I had written on it, I had preached on it. My, my master's thesis promoted it. And now he was gonna take that away from me? If if that's not what was happening, then what was happening? And that's what I want to share on this morning. I want to say that for some of you, you've long ago let go of this idea that God needed to avenge his wrath by punishing his son in your place. It doesn't work that way. But then if, if you go there, you have to rebuild. What does the cross mean? I was told, I was told well, the, you're an enemy of the cross now. You don't believe in the cross. You don't believe in sin. You don't I'm like, yeah, I do. It's like, well, then what about, then what's the cross about? Like, Let me tell you. And this took um, 13 years of mentoring by a retired Orthodox monk. And I'll be sharing from that. And this is the historic Christian tradition. So I'm going to share today that Number one, the cross, of God, the cross reveals the love of God. And number two, it was a decisive act of victory. And so we'll unpack that a little bit. First of all, the cross is a revelation. God sent his son into the world in part to reveal his own nature. What is God like? Let me tell you, he's exactly like Jesus. And it's not like, well, there's Jesus, but there's also this other side. No, all the fullness of God dwelled in Jesus in bodily form. How much? 
all the fullness. And that uh, there's an old Latin phrase that we could translate from the West. It says that all the operations of God in this world, all, that's a strong statement, all the operations of God in this world are undivided. That means anything Jesus did, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were doing through Jesus. And all this fullness is in there, and Jesus then is for us the image of the invisible God, and that image is profound and infinite and constant, unfailing love over and over and over. As you saw, I tried to suggest with the chairs last night, eternal pursuit of us. And so um, we, we look at Christ, we look at his life, we look at his ministry, and then it comes to this incredible climax on the cross where the cross then becomes our clearest focus on the nature of God. Isn't that amazing? If you want to know what God looks like, you look at the cross, and when you bring it into sharpest focus possible, it's cruciform, that means cross-shaped. The cross is a revelation of three aspects, at least, of the love of God that I'll share. That it, it's the self-giving, radically forgiving, co-suffering love of God. I'll unpack those. First of all, the cross shows us God's self-giving love. Some of the early fathers would call it God's self-donation. He is always pouring himself out like this infinite spring, a waterfall that can never dry up or stop. And uh, religion would tell you, paddle harder. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how hard you paddle, the waterfall won't increase. Because it's infinite. Religion will say, don't be lazy. But you know what? No matter how lazy you are, how bad or bad, drunk or bad or going out on the town, like uh, those of us who are addicts, when we acted out, we found out the waterfall didn't slow down. Infinite. It can't ever increase or decrease because it's infinite, but it's not static. It's always flowing, always pouring, always giving. Now, of course, sometimes God will say, you need to paddle a little harder here or you're going to hit those rocks. And sometimes I hit those rocks. Sometimes he'll say, you need to stop paddling so hard or you're going to hit your wife's canoe. Right? But um, those are quality of life issues. Don't drink so hard. Okay. Why? Will you love me less? No! Because you'll have a hangover. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it matters how you live, but it doesn't affect the flow of God's infinite love. It can't. So we've got this, this self-giving love of God, but we see it especially on the cross where we read that in Philippians 2 that Christ emptied himself and came and, and took the form of a servant. Now, I used to think that meant he was like this almighty, all-powerful emperor in the sky, and then he temporarily became humble and, and uh, you know, like even weak somehow, and, and he's now slumming it with us peasants, but it was sort of pretend, because then, boom, the resurrection, he goes back to being Zeus. Oh, wait. No. What the cross reveals is that from all time and all eternity, God has been a self-giver and a self-emptier. Even in the community of the Trinity, always giving love, deferring, uh, reciprocating. There's this incredible, beautiful, self-giving love in the Trinity that gives rise to a self-giving love that says, let's create all things. And so the very creation of God is a self-giving event. The incarnation of Christ into this world as a man is a self-giving event. But on the cross, we see it come into clearest focus, where he gives his own life for the sake of the world. This, is, this, this means that he's always been humble. He's always been a servant God. He's never been the tyrant king that just gets his own way. It's been all about self-giving and making space for the other. 
Father makes space for Son, who makes space for Spirit, who makes space for Father. Father, Son, and Spirit make space for the world, make space for natural law, make space for human freedom, make space for you, make space for rebellion and crucifixion, and then overcomes it. Not by coercion, but by resurrection and life. And so he, uh, this incredible self-giving element, we need to understand this about God. How much more will he freely give you all things? Romans 5 says, right? Self-giving, radically forgiving. I, ha I was interrogated by a nine-year-old. It was a wonderful experience. It took about three days. I ended up on a holiday, and the, these other parents were with us, and they had their, this, this kid, and they're like, we want to apologize in advance. He has a million questions for you, and he's been preparing them for months. I just want a suntan and do some snorkeling. But, but there's nothing like an inquisition from a nine-year-old. So we went to it, man. It was awesome. He starts out. He said, he said um, where will I begin? On the cross, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, do you think the Father said yes? And I said, what do you think? And he said, I think Jesus always prayed in the will of his Father. And so if the Father said, forgive them, he did. I'm like, that sounds right to me. And he said, who is them? Uh, who do you think is them? <laughs> Jesus asks twice as many questions as he answers in the Gospels. So, so can I. All right. And he said, well... I suppose that would include even the, the priests in the Sanhedrin, right, that condemned him? I'm like, yeah, that sounds right, them. He said, I suppose it would include the, uh, the Romans and the, like Pilate and the soldiers that, that beat him up and stabbed him and all that, right? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds right. He said, do you think it includes Judas? I'm like, hmm, what do you think? <laughs> and he said, well... Do you think Jesus loved Judas? I said, what do you think? And he said, well, I think he really loved Judas because he invited him to be his disciple. And then he said, um, do you think Judas loved Jesus? I'm like, what do you think? And he said, I think he did because he followed him. When G Judas followed Jesus and Jesus sent out the 12 to do miracles, did Judas go do miracles? Or did Judas stay at home and Jesus is like, oh, there's 11 again. We'll all partner up with Thaddeus here. Or, no, probably Judas was out there laying hands on the sick, casting out demons, maybe. You know, it's like, this was kind of making my mind get bigger. And then he said, uh, I, think, I think we really know that Judas uh, loved Jesus. He said, do you think Judas was sorry that he that he betrayed Jesus? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. What do you think? He says, well, I think he was really sorry. I'm like, why do you think that? Well, he threw the money back in the temple, didn't he? I'm like, yes, he did. He said, do you think, do you think if, if Judas hadn't killed himself that Jesus would have, that Jesus forgave him? Like, on, that his, on the cross he forgave him? And, and I'm like, well, yeah, he did that with Peter, right? And he said, what about what about now? Like, where do you think Judas is? I'm like, well, what do you think? And he said, I think Jesus went down into Hades, didn't he, to preach to the dead? Yes, the Bible says that. Jesus went down into Hades to preach to the dead. He said, do you think Judas was there? Like, where else is he going to be? He said, do you think when Judas hear Jesus preaching to the dead that he said yes to Jesus? I'm like, I don't know. Nobody knows. And he said, do you think it'd be okay if I prayed for Judas? I'm like, ask your priest. <laughs> and your mother. So he did, and his mother and his priest said, yeah, that would be okay. These are the advantages of being orthodox. You get to, you get to pray for anybody. 
So, oh, wait, and so here's my caveat. I'm Orthodox. I won't be in agreement with all the speakers here, and you won't be in agreement with here, but you bring in an outsider, you get a different angle, right? That's a good thing. So, um, so what am I saying about that? Oh, radically forgiving. Radic how radical? That was the kid's question. How far, does this, this, how far does this forgiveness thing go? Does it go just to your friends who've offended you? Or does it go to your enemies? How about your murderers? How about your best friend who betrays you to murderers? How about to those in hell? Oh, well, I'm very hopeful about this. That the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ is far more radical. It's wider, higher, deeper, and longer than you can grasp or understand and can hang on to. And you will need the power of the Holy Spirit even to get a glimpse of it because it is beyond what you ask or imagine. And I have a big imagination. Not as big as my nine-year-old friend, but I'm working on it. Radical forgiveness. There is something, I was preaching on this in, uh, recently, and a woman gave a testimony after, and she said, as you were preaching on, on, on Jesus opening up the, even the gates of hell, I became more and more furious. And she's a grace person. But she needed, she needed there to be some kind of violent satisfaction that would somehow satisfy her justice. Because, you see, a policeman had shot and killed her son not all that long ago. And she embraced grace, but when she realized that embrace might have to include that guy. Actually, what it did, it transformed her. It set her free. She was able to release him, and, and it was quite amazing. Uh, so radical forgiving. The cross reveals God's self-giving, radically forgiving, co-suffering love. Co-suffering is literally compassion. That's what it means. Passion, suffering. Calm, Oh, suffering with us. Jesus shows us on the cross that God, through the incarnation, has stepped into the human condition in all its fullness and in all its depths. When I talked about Jesus even crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We find out God never did, and he answers, but he still cried it out. Why? Because he was standing in solidarity with even those who have despaired and taken their own lives. He has embraced the depths of the human condition and that on the cross, he takes up human nature into himself. And, and uh, when Hebrew says that, you know, he was tested at all points as we are, I used to think, well, that's not totally true. He didn't know what it was to be raped. Oh, are we so sure about that? Do you know what soldiers do in imperial? We don't know, but, but we do know this. He didn't only just suffer what he suffered in his, himself. He suffered what you've suffered in you. So, did, was Jesus ever raped? Millions and millions and millions of times throughout history, and he draws all of that into him. Every bullet from every war, from every handgun, every rape, every sexual assault, every bit of shrapnel from... Uh, every bit of nuclear radiation from bombs we've dropped to the drones that come to the nail bombs in Northern Ireland to the bus bombs in Afghanistan, all of that up into himself and he swallows it in love. This is how powerful the love of God is that, it, that he can truly say, I know what it is even to die. Any dead people here yet? Nope, not yet. Okay. A few of you might have come back. But uh, this is then at the cross, he takes it to the nth degree. He goes right into the human experience of death itself. And now here's the beautiful thing about that, uh, is that he's going to conquer that, which we'll get to in a minute. Well, that could be our segue. So we've gone, we look at the cross, we look at the cross, and we see God as he truly is, self-giving, radically forgiving, co-suffering love. But it's not just a revelation as if, here's some information for you. It was also a decisive act of victory that, that uh, has been rolling all through his life already, but it hits a climax here. So the idea is this. Uh, the cross isn't to be thought of uh, in isolation from the whole life of Jesus. This starts at his, this starts at his conception in this way. 
How does salvation work in this Eastern model? The eternal Son of God, God the Son, who cannot die, must find a doorway to death so he can blow it up, so he can enter there and destroy it from the inside. But because he's God, he can't die. So he takes on a human nature so he can die. And in that human nature, he is able to die, but in dying, he passes through the doorway of death into that whole realm. But because he's God, he destroys it forever. There's a completely different situation after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. When, just as a, an aside, you cannot read the story of the rich man and Lazarus and understand it apart from what happened in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Something changed forever. All right, what changed? So, Jesus comes, God the Son assumes human flesh, passes through the doorway we call dying into the place we call death, destroys it. Death is killed and can't hold them, and it's a lot like uh, if you ever watched Men in Black, there's this scene where this big giant alien bug comes and he eats, what's, what's the guy's name? Tommy Lee Jones. And he eats him, and, and now Mar um, Will Smith is standing there and he's like, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> and suddenly you hear a and it's this gun charging up from inside the bug, and all of a sudden, boom, it blows up from the inside. Well, this is Eastern theology of the resurrection. Jesus enters that monster, and it cannot hold him because he did, it, it sought to just take a human, but it pulled in God. And death is death. Death is destroyed in the death of Christ. So, um, so we get a victory here over Satan's sin and death. I'll start with sin. So how does Jesus' victory uh, free us from sin? Depends who you ask on the stage this weekend. Here is one angle, and it's not the only one. But uh, I used to believe it was like this transaction, right? He, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Or uh, he... he uh, he became poor so that we could become rich. This, in Athanasius, this is exchange language, but we mistook it sometimes for transaction language. It's not like somebody goes into the bank and signs off on my debts, and now it's in a ledger somewhere. No, it's like a rich person marries a poor person, and now the poor person's rich because of union. We have come into the riches of God through union with him, not some kind of bank transaction off in the sky. And in coming to union with him, um, all, that is, all the resources of God come, become mine in this union, in this marriage. My debts are canceled not because he went to the banker. My debts are canceled because I married him. And not only that... Uh, I find he's doing other things. And so, so my friend Pat, who's here today, he talks about if you think of sin as a cancer, and a, a cancer that distorts and, and destroys, and it, this cancer, actually, it has to be removed, but how is it removed? It's like the, the Son of God comes into, into my nature and begins healing it from the... It's a blood transfusion with some kind of incredible radioactive life that is able to change me in fact, not just in heaven. So uh, I'm, I'm on a road of transformation. It'll take like, it could take 300 years. I'm not gonna probably get done in this life, but I, I believe he's going to transform us completely from glory to glory into the image of Jesus Christ himself. This is, we call this theosis. All the early, this will sound almost Mormon to some of you, but all the early, early bishops would say this. God became human so that humans could become God. Now, it's not that you become Yahweh. You don't become the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. But the idea is this. You become, you become by grace 
what Christ is by nature. And that means you'll be glorified into the image of his son. And here's the ironic thing. You'll still be you. You'll be more you than you've ever been. It will not be about eradicating your personhood or making you not you. Oh no, it is the you that you were always meant to be, your true self that, at its deepest, deepest level. All right, so self-giving, radically forgiving, co-suffering love, victory over sin. Also, victory over Satan. Now, I, I'm a charismatic, small C. Um, done the whole exorcism thing a lot. Pretty good at it. Except I have some questions about that. It feels like kind of weird in light of that Jesus said in jo the Gospel of John, uh, now, talking about the hour of his death, now the prince of this world is driven out. So why am I repopulating heaven all the time with scary creatures? The Son of God went about destroying the works of the devil. And yeah, I know there's spirits and I know that we got to deal with them and I know there's real evil. So I don't totally get how it all works. I just want you to know who won. There is a ruling spirit over Denver and its name is Holy. The Holy Spirit through the victory of Jesus Christ because of the love of the Father has at the cross already done it, won it. And those who are in, in bondage now that begin to see this get free. And so it's not like, oh, I got to go make my transaction again. It's like, I, I'm going to go meet the victor. I got to let the victor do what the victor does. But, but the battle's done, you guys, as of the cross. It's a mighty victory over, over sin, over Satan. And now we'll mention death again. And this is where, this, this is uh, just so beautiful to me that in the early church, very quickly, they, start, they actually did start conflating Hades and hell for one reason, because he beat it all, right? So we would make distinctions. I do in my book, Her Gates Will Never Be Shut, distinctions between Hades as this afterlife expectation of judgment and Gehenna as the sort of destruction of Jerusalem in Jeremiah's time and now again in, in all of that stuff. So I make these distinctions, but the truth is that that also the church began to just say, death, Hades, hell, let's package it up and put it under his feet. That's what this picture is about. This is the icon of the resurrection. Isn't that interesting? It's the resurrection, but where, what's he doing here? The Lord Jesus Christ is descending into Hades. He's standing on the broken doors of Hades and you can see that he shattered all the locks and the gears and the chains below. In some parts of this, you'll also see Hades or Satan bound up below. And he's defeated them. And now he's descended into the lower parts of the earth, uh, according to Ephesians. And he finds Adam and Eve. And as he draws Adam and Eve up, he's drawing human nature up. This is the imagery here. He enters death and Hades and even hell itself and, and draws up human nature, lifts it up, and a, ch a train, a train follows him. A, a cap, he takes captivity a captive, it says in, in, in Ephesians. It's like a parade forms behind him. Where did we get this idea? Well, partly Ephesians, partly 1 Peter, but also we have something uh, where we get more details about what they're alluding to. These are allusions, but we actually have a whole narrative. Narrative is in the Gospel of Nicodemus. It's really kind of a funny little book. It, it was considered an orthodox gospel, but it doesn't get into our Bibles because it's not really about the life of Jesus. So it, it's not meant to be in our New Testament, but it also was not considered heretical. And what it is, it's, it's an it's a exploration theologically of Christ's victory over Hades. And here's the picture, but the words go like this, that, that Jesus Christ is, is going to die. And... Satan and Beelzebub, no, Beelzebub and Hades, I think, they're, they're talking and they're like, something's going on and, and I think it's Satan says to Hades, what's going on? And, and Hades says, John the Baptist is here and it's, that's not a good sign. 
Why is it not a good sign? Because he's preaching and he's a forerunner. In the Orthodox Church, we don't call him John the Baptist. Usually we call him John the Forerunner. And if John the Forerunner is preaching in Hades, guess who's coming? <laughs> they cut away from the scene and you've got the John the Baptist. Maybe he's got a head here and one on his, under his arm. And he's like, and he's preaching and he's saying, Jesus of Nazareth is coming here. And when he comes, he will preach good news. And when you hear the good news, you should respond. We cut back to Hades and Satan now. And Hades is like, go out front and see if you can prevent him from coming in. Why is that? Because if he comes in, this show is over. And then Jesus comes in. And that's where he makes his way all through the caverns and the, the darks and the depths of, of Hades down into the very bottom. And there's Adam, there's Eve, grabs them by the hand and leads them out. And as he does, a stream of people flow behind him. Now in the early church, um, there was some debate. Will, does everyone follow him or do just some follow him? Do only the Old Testament saints follow him? Or is it, as First Peter says, even the wicked of the wicked, those who perished in the flood, do they follow him? And you've got this amazing th proclamation in First Peter where he says, when Jesus preaches, and the word is evangelion, gospeling, preaching good news, in, that, in the prison where the spirits of those who perished in the flood were in bondage, it says this, those who were, made, who were judged in the flesh, were made alive in the spirit. And Peter uses that same actual language for Jesus' own death and resurrection. He who was condemned in the flesh has been made alive in the spirit. Um, now, I'm not gonna put a whole theology around, around the gospel of Nicodemus, but I, what I will say this is, based in Ephesians, based in 1 Peter, based in Nicodemus, the whole East Orthodox Church embedded a liturgy that we do every Sunday Parts of it are identical, and parts of it we rotate. Every Sunday in my church is at Easter service, every single Sunday, because we tell through our liturgy the entire drama of redemption, leading to the victory on the cross and proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As part of that liturgy, we have something called the Octo Echoes. The Octo Echoes are a part that during the Matin church service, we chant, and the prominent predominant, overwhelmingly uh, predominant theme of the Octo Echoes is Jesus' victory over death for all and his resurrection for all and this salvation provided for all. And I, I'm, I'm going to chant it to you because that's what I do. So sometimes I'm, I wear robes and I swing incense. You got to know this. Okay, so picture that, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and, and we're chanting, and I'm going to just throw up my hand when, when I say all, and this is a selection of a, a bunch of the octo echoes for you. You are willingly nailed to the cross, O merciful one, and laid in a tomb as a mortal, O giver of life. By your death, O powerful one, you crushed its might. For hell's gatekeepers trembled before you. You raised with you the dead from every age. Death gave up the dead it had swallowed, while hell's reign, which brought corruption, was destroyed when you rose from the tomb, O Lord. You opened the gates of hell for the souls from every age. When the Savior went down as a mortal to the prisoners, the dead from every age arose with him. You rose from the tomb on the third day and made life dawn for the world. As giver of life and God, establish my mind to do your will. When you rose from the dead by your power, O Savior, you raised up with you the human race, granting us life and incorruption. Christ has despoiled hell, as alone mighty and powerful has raised up with himself all those in corruption. Let us praise as almighty God, one who rose on the third day, smashed the gates of hell, and roused the age-long dead from the grave, 
Therefore, hell groans, death laments, the world exalts, and all rejoice together. For you, O Christ, have granted resurrection to all. When you, O supremely exalted, had willingly for our sakes became as one, with no help in a slain corpse among the dead, you freed us all and raised us up with you for your mighty hand. You are the light of those in darkness. You are the resurrection of all and the life of mortals, and you have raised up all with yourself, despoiling the might of death, O Savior, smashing the gates of hell, O Word. And when the dead saw the miracle, they were amazed, and all creation rejoices in your resurrection. Having been nailed to the cross, you've poured forth salvation, O Christ, to all people. Your soul made divine, O Savior, plundered the treasuries of hell and raised with it the souls from every age, while your life-bearing body became a source of incorruption for all. Before the, your death, O Christ, you raised Lazarus from hell, dead for four days, thereby shaking the power of death and foreshadowing through the raising of one beloved man the salvation of all people from incorruption or from corruption. Hell rules the race of mortal men, but not eternally. For when you were placed in the grave, O powerful one, you tore asunder the bars of death by your life-creating hand and proclaimed true deliverance to those sleeping there from ages to ages, since you, O Savior, have become the firstborn of the dead. Amen. Did you, so this is... This is his descent into Hades. In, 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 it's interesting because in the Greek it's Hades, but in English the Orthodox have chosen, chosen to sort of combine death and hell together under that one term. And that as he's conquered death, he's conquered hell. As he's emptied death, he's emptying hell. So this is, to me, it is very hopeful, but uh, uh, to clarify, not mere hope. Mere hope is wishful thinking. My hope is Jesus Christ. And I can cast myself on that hope with a lot of confidence. And, uh, and so it seems to me that, that there's this incredible Eastern heritage about the conquest of hell that we forgot in the West. Like, har you hardly ever hear preaching about Holy Saturday. And what happened between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, it's he went down, he preached, he conquered, he came back, and he brought a boatload of people with him. So uh, this, this is just a wonderful thing. I'm, I want to close with a sermon someone else preached. And it's only, uh, it's, it's four paragraphs, and I'm only going to give you the last half of it. It's called it's called Chrysostom's Paschal Homily. What it means is this. Every, every uh, Easter, well, it's, it's actually the Saturday night. Our Easter service starts at midnight. And we begin it this way. We all go outside, and we light candles, and we circle the church three times, and we sing about the resurrection of Christ. And then we come to the front door and the priest who is dressed up as Jesus in, in victory in a, say, a kingly robe, he bangs on the door, boom, boom, boom. And it's like, who is it? It's the king of glory. Open the doors that the king of glory may come in. And you hear from behind, who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Mount Lord, mighty in battle. Open the doors that the king of glory may come. Who is this king of glory? Boom, boom, boom. And you do this little thing. And it's like, in one way, you're entering the doors of the church, but in another, you are depicting Christ's demand to enter the gates of hell and death. Finally, the doors open, and we go in. And, and, and now candles are streaming into a pitch black room, and it's becoming light in the dark. And we start, and we, we're singing about, about that, he, that he's brought his light into the world, and we start making the sign of the cross with our candles in the dark. And it's like eer, eerily beautiful. And then we start chanting, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tomb, bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tomb bestowing life. And it gets more, and finally, there, Christ is risen from, I mean, it, it, it gets heavy metal on you. It's really amazing. <laughs> and so then you proceed with like, uh, 
liturgy that's way too long for Baxter for a while. But then at some point, I'm going to get him to come, and you're going to get to hear the Paschal homily in context, but you'll get to hear it out of context here. When Chrysostom wrote the liturgy and preached this sermon, the, 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 uh, the people said that was such an anointed sermon, we must preach it every Easter until the Lord returns. And they have since the late 300s. Every single Paschal homily in every single Orthodox church repeats this. Enjoy ye all the feast of faith. Receive ye all the riches of loving kindness. Let no one bewail his poverty, for the universal kingdom has been revealed. Let no one weep for his iniquities, for pardon has shone forth from the grave. Let no one fear death, for the Savior's death has set us free. He that was held prisoner of it has annihilated it. By descending into hell, he made hell captive. He embittered it when it tasted of his flesh. And Isaiah, foretelling this, cried, Hell, said he, was embittered when it encountered thee in the lower regions. It was embittered, for it was abolished. It was embittered, for it was mocked. It was embittered, for it was slain. It was embittered, for it was overthrown. It was embittered, for it was fettered in chains. It took a body and met God face to face. It took earth and encountered heaven. It took which was seen and fell upon the unseen. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, hell, where is your victory? Christ is risen and you were overthrown. Christ is risen and the demons are fallen. Christ is risen and the angels rejoice. Christ is risen and life reigns. Christ is risen and not one dead remains in the grave. For Christ being risen from the dead has become the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. To him be glory and dominion unto ages of ages. Amen.